Hi, and uh, welcome to Midland Mencap's first podcast, uh, our first attempt to uh, take our world onto the uh, video vlogging podding stage. I'm here with Tom, who's uh, already a well-known blogger uh, for Midland Mencap. Uh, what we're going to do um, is uh, introduce ourselves a little bit, uh, talk about things that are going on inside Midland Mencap, uh, some things that are going on outside in the uh, in the big brave world of Brexit, and just generally have a nice relaxed yep. chat. So uh, what do you think, what do you make of that, Tom? Yep, that sounds good to me. Okay, here we go. The um, main thing that's happening this year inside Midland Mencap is that it's seventy years mm. since the organisation. Uh, was formed, yeah. um, an organisation formed by uh, family carers of people with learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. The organisation formed uh, in Birmingham, uh, straight after the Second World War. Uh, the first meeting of the organisation was held at the Friends Meeting House in Bull Street. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. And uh, what the uh, people who attended that meeting were trying to do, Tom, was uh, set up a an organisation run by family carers mm -hmm. that uh, looked after the interests of people with a learning disability at a time when people spent most, if not all, of their lives in institutions. Mm -hmm. Their ambition was to improve the life chances, the life opportunities of people with a learning disability, to address issues in uh, ensuring people had access to education, appropriate support, and also to try to uh, promote and campaign for people to be included more in society. Mm -hmm. Do you think those hopes and ambitions of those family carers have been seen through to the 70th year? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I, think, I, think it's, I think that's one of the reasons why it's working is because of how many people are involved and that's what keeps an organisation going as long as people are still involved and support and still like what what they do that's why that's why something works because people are behind it and as long as you always have supporters behind something it will grow for as long as as it wants to and as long as people still want the service around it will keep on going for those who are desperate in need of it those original families back in 1949, they wanted to be very influential. They wanted to be able to tell people what it was that they felt that they wanted, mm. how they wanted it, when they wanted it. Do you think that's something that they would recognise in Midland Mencap today? <sighs> Bit of a hard question, really. Like, um, I suppose people of like my mum's age and, and my nan their sort of generation, they had it hard because um, my mum was on the streets at age 13. So in in that retrospect, I think, um, I think they had it, their childhood was a lot harder than in their time because they didn't have the sort of understanding and, and the help that was there in their time. Whereas now, there's a little bit more understanding of how times get hard. Um, I think some people are still a bit sort of unsure of how to get the help and, and where it needs it. But I think going, given time, it will, more and more people will get to understand and and be like, oh, okay, this is working, this is what it is. Because I think that's the problem, is that when people first understand the service, they're like, oh, okay, what's this? How, how does it help me? Where, where is it? You know, that's, I think that's the hardest concept of it all, in that <coughs> people don't straight away go, oh, this is great, you know, I'll, I'll use this. They, ne they need to sort of process it and and take time to understand how it can work for them yeah yeah I, th I think i think you're right and i think the, the the other bit is is to what degree people think that they can exercise choice and control and say to organizations like midland mencap 
this is the way that I would like that service to be offered mm. and this is when I would like it to be available and I would like to be very influential in how that service continues to be delivered not just to me but 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 to other people mm. I mean do you think that that's the sort of organization that Midland Men Cup is yeah yeah I think so yeah um and I think you know they're not they're not they're not shy to sort of get involved and and help people um I mean yes okay there are there are boundaries um which and say the word red tape that you have to go through but you find ways around it you know you talk to people you get out there and there's no solution that can't be fixed because there's always a way to find things you just you just have to I guess you just have to spread the word out there and just hope that that again hope that people will support it and and believe in what you're trying to put out there and what you're trying to achieve and and sell and people will believe and go okay I believe in this organisation therefore I'll stick with it great great. I mean it is the organisation's 70th birthday Mm. um, which I think in itself is a a fantastic achievement Um, I think it shows that the uh, reasons that the original founding families got together in the first place um, uh, has kept the organisation very focused it's still an organisation whose governance um, is, is about people with a learning disability it's, a, it's, a, it's about those family carers our board is still very much uh, part, part uh, run by, by family carers so that voice has never, never left the organisation one of the things that we're looking to do uh, for the 70th birthday is uh, find, find the right way to celebrate that and, mm. and what we're thinking about doing is um, having that celebration in June um, so that the the three weeks of learning disability week, family carers week, and mm. uh, volunteering national volunteering week, uh, will our celebration will bridge those three weeks, mm. and uh, we'll have a proper proper knees up, a proper party. Mm. We've also been working on a an, an archiving project, which is looking at all of the organisation has um, thousands of photographs that go right across um, those seven decades from, from, from 1949 to, to, to today and uh, to bring that uh, to a public exhibition so that mm. people can um, enjoy the photographs but also realise what a contribution those families and, and, and people with a learning disability have made to the city of Birmingham. Mm. A lot of the photographs show some very interesting things. They show uh, the city in a way that it doesn't look any longer, it's been redeveloped, uh, fashion, um, all sorts of different things that uh, you can take from, from, from those photographs. But the, the most important bit is that bit, you know, how people with a learning disability have contributed mm. to life in the city. Yeah. I mean, how, how, how do you feel that, that, you know, individuals like yourself are making that contribution? Um... Talk, talk to us about your uh, your volunteering role okay. at the uh, food share. Right, so, the... Uh, I think the problem is, is, unfortunately, um, some people are sort of scared to come forward to an organisation like yeah. this. Not because they don't want to, yeah. but primarily they're scared of being judged, um... They're scared of not being listened to because there's there's a lot of difference between, well, not a lot, but a big difference between people who don't have a disability and kids that my kids like myself do in that there is so much pressure on how to deal with it because it's it's a scary world out there. You know, they're thrown straight into... Um, school there, and then they have to they have the peer pressure of um, trying to fit in you know it's so hard for them okay. that straight away they need help and they need to find something that can help them because there is so much pressure on them to be normal um, and, and is that pressure 
affected the way that you feel that you've been able to promote yourself as as somebody who can make a contribution? Yeah, uh, yeah, it has. Um, and I think the reason why I'm so passionate about my voluntary work mm. with the junk food project yeah. is because um, I'm sadly I lost uh, a friend of mine who was volunteering with the project. Um, and if it wasn't for her, um, she found me the project yeah. and it's, it, if it wasn't for her, then I wouldn't be as passionate about no. the project as I am now. Tell me about, tell me about that project um, and what you well, do there. It's, unfortunately, this country has a big problem in terms of waste. We don't we don't realise how much food we're wasting, um, and we're based in our project is based in King's Heath, and we, our our aim is to feed bellies, not bins. And it's a good slogan. Um, we work with um, we work with Ocado, Morrison's, uh, Waitrose. And rather than food going to compost, we we have it and we cook with it, and we have a we're not a charity, but we purely rely on donations to keep us to keep us going. Um, so we have share houses, we have people coming volunteering for the share house to pack the food, to drive the food. Um, and sometimes we've had like a few Christmases ago we had a huge range of turkeys that was <laughs> just by the use by date yeah. there was one little prick on the packaging and they wanted to be thrown away and that is how bad the food has got um, in that use by date it it's shocking and it's scary like some food it can be perfectly fine but because of the use by date they don't they don't want it um so so working in the in in the food share project i mean what what have you taken from that yourself how have you um, if you like moved on from school and now you're you're this active citizen making that volunteering contribution i mean what does that mean to you personally it it means that in my own way that I'm contributing to there not being food waste. So I purely shop by using the product, mm. um, by signing up for a free gun bag. And in that free gun bag for a family, um, you get uh, you get fruit, you get veg, um, you get essentials, like sometimes you may get um, a toilet roll or the essentials yeah. that you need, like um, bananas or fruit, um, any type of fruit, really. Um, and it just by... At the cafe, we mainly cook vegan and vegetarian food. Sometimes we'll use meat in our food but not not very mm. often mm. it's very rare that we do get it um but what about you personally i mean what what, what sort of skills and and, and experiences um, do you think that that volunteering like that has given you um just to enjoy food yeah. more and and realize that yes okay um i wouldn't i would myself i wouldn't purely go on a diet without meat yeah. Um, because I need it to keep my muscles and everything else going. But um, I use it in a good way in that I make curries, um, I make recipes. So it's changed your mindset, yeah, really. Yeah, it has. You've become think, more, more aware and more sort of ethical. And I think if, if people can, if we can all find a project 
like the Junction Project in our area, yep. then we can all do our little bit. So you'd recommend volunteering then? I, I do, or, or even just using the share house and, and yeah. going and, and getting a crate because it's, because it is so, you know, the, that it, is, it helps in a big way. So the share house becomes part of the community. Yeah, it does. And, and people, um, and also like myself, is that we don't, until we go there, we don't know what food shopping we're going to do. Sure. We're going to get until, until we go. Brilliant. Um, and I, I help with, at my cafe, I also help with a boutique where at the boutique we sell, <laughs> we sell everything from cereals to water and um, anything Amazing. we get in, yeah. we, we sell it and all we ask for, and that's the motto of the donor, <coughs> of the company, all we ask is for your time and donation and that's what keeps the organisation going. Brilliant. Brilliant. Let's talk about some other things that you've been involved in. Okay. Um, I know it's a little while ago now, but but you were part of a, a very successful sports team. Uh, yeah. You uh, joined uh, Midland Mencaps hockey team, and yep. within a very short space of time, that team went on to win the European Para Hockey Championships yes, in Amsterdam. Tell me all about that journey, the joining the team, uh, the experience for you, because I think you know that's an incredible story. And yeah, um, well, I, I've never really done sports before. Yeah, um, I was never really picked really, um, and I just, I just remember, I'd, I'd been sort of, <laughs> um, I'd been doing um, Dynamo Club in Minaman Cap on and off for quite a while yeah. and it got to a point where um, I thought, you know, maybe there's something else in the organisation that I could do or partake in um, and, I, and I saw the um, trip that when they went to London and I thought, oh, that might be something that would interest me um, and uh, I, I, my mum won't mind me saying this. I did joke with her. I said, <laughs> I said, mum, how would you feel if I took part in hockey and gave it a go? She said, well, well, can first of all, will you be all right hitting the ball? And people <laughs> should be scared of you in case they get hit by a ball. I was like, <laughs> it is a dangerous, dangerous <laughs> sport. It, it can be, but. But it's not. It's not about that. It's about. It's about doing the sport that you love and enjoy. And I, I thought, okay, I'll give it a go. Um, and I hadn't really. I'd known Steve and Laura on and off through various Mencap events, but I hadn't really worked with them properly until hockey. Um, and I was quite, I was quite nervous of working with Steve, to be honest. Um, even though he's he acts all hard and and strict, he he's not. He, he's like he's a big PE teacher. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he is. Um, and I, I just, I, I, so I tried. Um, and I, I, I still remember my first, my first day. Yeah. Um, tr training actually it feels like yesterday um, I know people won't agree with me and those people that know me in main cap wouldn't agree that I'm shy <laughs> they just wouldn't no. um, but I was really shy really nervous um, so so joining a team what what did that mean because you said a bit earlier that when you were at school you didn't really get picked to take part in that type of thing so there you are with with all the other hockey players. What 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 was that like? Um, it was quite nerve wracking because I thought, you know, at, at the before there wasn't even any talk of Amsterdam. It was just like playing hockey and and giving it a go. Yeah. Um, and I I sort of looked at all the other players around me and I thought. Part of me did think, I can't do this, I, I can't do this. And I, I, I'd take Steve to one side and I, I'd go, 
Steve, I don't think I can do this. And he, he'd, <laughs> he'd say I was talking nonsense and all that. Yeah. Um, I'd, get, I'd get so scared. Uh, sometimes I'd only last five minutes and, and want to get off. <laughs> <laughs> because I felt I felt scared um, because how, how, how did starting to take part uh, in, in sport uh, help you with things like your health and well-being your, your confidence because we, we have spoken about this privately before mm. but you, you know it, that was a big thing for you wasn't it yeah yeah it, it really was um, and I think and I think the reason why um, I got best newcomer um, after Amsterdam was because Steve saw something in me that I didn't see in myself um, in all the times that he was coaching me. That's brilliant. I went from <clears throat> someone who had never picked up a hockey, a hockey stick, <laughs> had never hit a ball, never run with a ball, um, and to go to Amsterdam after not really doing it before, that, that really helped with my, not just my mental health, which um, it's still, still an ongoing struggle at the moment, but I'm getting there. Um, but it, I just felt doing hockey for them a few hours it didn't just do my mental health good, it it done my personal health so much better. I felt I started to feel like I'd finally some found finally found something that I could do and that I could enjoy and yeah, it, it did make me stronger, it made me feel healthier, um it just it just gave me the kick that I needed um, and something that I knew I was good at finally and I think that's that's why it means so much yeah. in that yes okay I'm not the I'm not the fittest <laughs> one on the team but it doesn't matter I've, I've still gone out there and and it wasn't anyone else that that got a medal and went to Amsterdam and it was me and I think... Let's just talk about that for a minute because here you are, a, a, a group of, uh, of, of, of young people who've, who've, who've probably not really been involved in sport uh, before, they probably went through school and, and, and didn't take part in a lot of sport, that, mm. that was what you were telling me before. And there you are in Amsterdam, the European Hockey Championships. The uh, men's and women's team are there taking part in the uh, in, in the main uh, European Championships. You're there taking part in the Para Championships against teams from Spain and Germany and Italy yeah. and Holland and Ireland and uh, all across Europe. And you're you're at the final. You've 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 trained hard. You've come together as a team. Tell me tell me what it was like to play in the European oh. final. Honestly, there is there is no feeling like it when you when you're walking on the pitch and you know that you've got supporters there. There was a lot of people travelled over from England to watch the final. Yeah. yeah. Um, and do, you, do you know that it was the biggest crowd ever to watch a para hockey match no, in the I world? No, I didn't know that. I didn't yeah. know that. Um, and um, I just wish. Um, Obviously, there's not as much of a stigma now um, due to the success of, of hockey. And it's kept on growing and growing. It really has. But unfortunately, um, people back at home or reporters, they they were probably thinking, oh, these are just kids. <laughs> we're not just kids. And that's what really hurts in that, they're, they're thinking, oh, these are disabled kids, what are they doing? Hang on a minute, we did, you know, we've gone out there, we didn't, we didn't go to people and go, oh, we think you should support us because we're disabled. No, we, we, we didn't do that. 
you know, we went as a team. Yes, we had disabilities, but that didn't stop us. We didn't so, care about that. So, so we're in the final. It's a draw in normal time and it's gone to penalties. Tell me what it was like oh. when that winning penalty went in. Honestly, the amount... Honestly, there was no feeling like it. Um, obviously, when you're watching football with your family and you're waiting for the person to take a penalty in football, obviously it's different because you're at home, <laughs> it's your home nation, and you're thinking, yeah. oh, please. But there you are in the European final. Yeah, and it is, honestly, I've never felt the feeling of being sick in my <laughs> stomach. That's brilliant. Um, and my hands were shaking because I just wanted to just, I think a few of us at the time, we were just like, oh, can we just get on the pitch now and just, just, just say it's bed. over, just say we've won and we can get on the pitch and we've won it. But obviously we couldn't and I felt so sorry for Matthew when he went up for his and it missed. Oh, <laughs> oh, so honestly, poor Matthew. So, so you, you're talking about other people that are in the team and that's an important thing to think about, really. Uh, what, what did it mean to you to actually be part of that team with, the, you know, with people who'd become very much your friends and, and, and you trained hard together? You were playing against teams that had been coached for much, much longer than than the English team, our team. Uh, what, t tell me about the friendship in the team. Oh, how can I not... <laughs> how can I not mention Mr Clayton? How can I not? I didn't think we'd get through the um, podcast without mention of Mr mm, Clayton. Yes. <laughs> but, but the whole team, the friendship that yeah. came... It's, yeah, and then that's kept you all together, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. It, it really has. Um, and I think that's why we're still a team now. In, in that we are so, we are so close. And it's like I said before, you know, yes, okay, we're not of, we're not, we're not all of the same fitness. We're not. <laughs> no, I wouldn't, um, I, I wouldn't describe you as the world's fittest uh, European champions <laughs> team I've ever seen, but you are probably the most dedicated. Um, and I think that's why we gel so well, is because yeah. we all have been there, um, we all we all are passionate about it, and honestly, as soon as Ross hit that final ball, yeah. I just I just ran. You did. I, I didn't. I was the first one to grab to grab hold of Ross. It was me and Reese. As soon as that yeah. poor Ross, he didn't even know what was happening. Me and I was like, right, I'm just running now. We, we Has didn't it really? Care. I, I mean, a, a lot of things have happened. I mean, you've been to other competitions. You've been to Barcelona mm. uh, for a competition since. But that 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 thing about uh, how you know that gold medal around your neck. You are a European champion. Mm. I mean, ha, from where you were, perhaps a year before that, to that mm. moment where you are that athlete, you are that sportsman that's won a European gold medal for England. Yeah. There's no feeling like it. No feeling like no it. No feeling Let's like talk about it. something that might have motivated you a little bit, because you've talked about, you know, uh, physical activity and its relationship to your mental health and physical well-being. You went on to start running and took part in your first competitive uh, 5K. Tell me about that. Yeah, well, um, and I thought of, this is partly to do with, to do with hockey yeah. as well, in... From doing hockey, um, and the friendships that I gained yeah. and still have now, yeah. um, I thought that I could go on to do something alongside it because I thought, you know, I've got, I've got support and I've got people behind me. Maybe I could stretch my wings a little bit and sort of get out there and try something else. Um, and I thought, oh, um, I'll give running a go. Um, obviously, everyone, everyone in the hockey team is scared of me now when I'm on the pitch, especially, <laughs> especially Steve. He's called me chainsaw and everything. Because whenever <laughs> I'm on the pitch, it's like, oh, no, 
me and Brin, uh-oh, stay away from them two. Our knees will be chopped off with them two running round. <laughs> um, and I, I thought one of my support workers suggested that I go to Bourneville Harriers Running Club. Yeah. And I thought, I thought, me? Nah, nah. I won't, I won't last five minutes. I'll be out of breath before I even start because that's my problem in that um, Steve would always go to me when I was doing hockey. Tom, come on, come off now. You're tired, come off. I'd, and I'd have to, I'd have to come off. And that's what I was thinking about running was, me? No, nah, I'll be tired in five minutes. I wouldn't, I wouldn't last that long. So you started training, beginning to get your, your fitness up. Yeah. And then you got to the 5K. Tell me about the day of the 5K, because it was, uh, oh. weather-wise, it wasn't the best day. Weather-wise, it was horrible. <laughs> Absolutely horrible. Um, and, um, yes, I do have a little, little bit of a rivalry with Gerard in the office. Yeah, just yeah. A, that just came across strongly bit. on the day. Just a little bit, even though I still maintain to this day, I still could have beaten him. Uh, and still want to. <laughs> um, but what did taking part in the 5K and finishing it in a really good time? I mean, oh, brilliant time. Um, I just, I had this feeling of, same with the hockey, I find, yet again, I found something that it wasn't anyone else, it was me going for it and doing it. And... Just finding something I enjoyed again. Um, I'll tell you, my, my, my memory was, I mean, I, I was stood at the finish line watching people, and mm. watching, I wasn't, wasn't running, watching people come through, and I saw you coming up the, uh, the final straight, probably about 100 yards I watched you run in, and uh, the uh, exhilaration on your face when you came through the finish um, obviously meant a lot to you. Yeah, it really did, it really did. Um, so, it, and afterwards, yep. um, afterwards, I was thinking, where was Gerard? Where did he come? I know, I saw you. Where did he come? And in my head, I was like, oh, please say I've beaten him. Please say I've beaten him. I was just... And Steve said to me, oh, you could have gone another lap. I was like, I was so exhausted. <laughs> I was like, I could, there was no way I could have done another lap. I was so exhausted. No, but again, you did something that you never thought you were able no, to do. No, and and a lot of your own motivation to do that. What would you say to other people who perhaps a similar experience to yours, they, they hadn't been encouraged to be active, they, they hadn't been picked for team sports at school? What, what, would, what would your message um, be, Tom, to, to people like well, that? Well, this is what one of the topics that I talked about in my one of my recent blogs for Minla Menka. Yeah. In, in that I wanted to empathise with people. Yes, there is a lot of peer pressure on people in magazines and, and, and TV. Um, and there seems to be this big contraception that you have to have muscles and, and you have to be fit. You don't. You, you, you don't. You, you don't need any of that. You don't need to take pills or, or medication to to get you them things, just be yourself, it doesn't matter what experience you've had, whether you've had a lot or or whether you've had a little bit, all that matters is that if you want to do something and you're passionate about doing it, don't let anyone else tell you not to, do it, go for it and you'll feel so much better because Yes, you'll feel exhausted. Yes, you'll feel knackered afterwards. But those are all part of it. That the adrenaline, the the feeling of it afterwards. No one has taken that away from you. You've done it. You've achieved it, and you feel you feel great afterwards. And I really do think that when it comes to running, just give it a go. You don't have to be Usain Bolt or or anyone, you don't have to run really fast, just give it a go and just enjoy it for what it is. That's brilliant. You mentioned um, a couple of minutes ago about about being a blogger, and writing mm. blogs, and you've started writing blogs for, for, for Middle and Mencap. Tell us about, about that. What what was the what was the idea behind becoming a blogger? Um, I think the idea behind 
becoming a blogger um, was I I think with in terms of mental health and, and disabilities um, I don't think there's many people that have that person that can be their eye that can be their voice or can be their spokesperson um, and sort of the person who's not afraid to say how things are and just talk about things that um, matter to them. Yeah. Um, and I was speaking to um, Jenny, who sometimes um, volunteers with us at hockey. Yeah. And the reason why she liked my blog so much, in especially in my one in um, for when I wrote it about Barcelona. Yeah is that as soon as she read it, straight away, without being there, watching it, straight away, she knew it, She knew what had happened. Just by reading it, yeah. she felt every word, and she understood. And, and that's, I think that's why I wanted to do it. Yeah. In, I wanted to get out there to people and and give something to someone that they can read and sort of go okay um, I've never heard about this um, and topics that people are quite shy to talk about I'm sorry to say but I'm not <laughs> but the thing about you know what I've enjoyed about your blogs You've uh, you've been very honest in them, and you've mm. talked about very personal experiences. Has has, has that helped you with things? Yeah, that, you know, you've talked has. about your mental health. You've talked about your physical well being. You've talked about issues that go on in people's lives. Uh, as as writing it down and 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 like you say, giving it out to other people to share with it, you. It really has, and that, I think that's that's one of the reasons why I, I wanted to do it. Yeah, is I wanted to I wanted to get people to sort of see my life yeah. and sort of see it through the eyes of how difficult being someone with a disability is. Yeah. It's not plain sailing. There are struggles. It, <laughs> if someone said to me, oh, you're disabled, you've got a disability, it's a walk in the park. No, it, it, it's not. It's it's not. So, so you, you, you've started writing your blogs and, and, and they've been you know, hugely well received. You've mm. lots of followers and you've, you've built up quite a big following. Yeah. How does that feel that you know that people are waiting for you to, to write your next blog? Oh, it, it, I can't tell you. It, it just feels so... And I think that's the reason why I, I like... why I like hockey so much is that I've finally found something that people are liking that I've done. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not anyone else's work or anyone else's words. It's my own. And the, the overwhelming support I've had from people who I've never even spoken to... Yeah. Um, just by reading mine, um, it's, uh, I, the amount of support that I've had is unbelievable. I've even got, um, I've even got an actor from, following me from Casualty. Really? Who, uh, yeah. Who has, who has been reading my blogs, so. Did, did, I mean, you, you are a good writer. I mean, that's, that's clear in the way that you, you know, you produce your blogs. I mean, was that something that you'd never done before as well? Um, you'd never written before? Well, I wrote imaginary stories when I was a kid. Right. Um, I think that's that's partly to do with my dyslexia, really, in, in that, um, for me, it was a way of expressing myself sure, sure. Um, and a way that no one could judge me because I was writing. Um and uh, when I was doing, um, taking part in drama schools, um, I had to do arts awards and I had to do a review 
um, like a, a review on one of the shows. Yeah. Um, and I found that quite harsh. Sure. Um, and I did have to do like a sort of daily blog for that. And I thought, oh, that maybe I could go into it. Um, and then I said, and then I left and it sort of just went on the back burner. I'd done a little bit of writing and sort of never went to it again. And mm-hmm. and until I met James and started talking to James about the idea of blogging, that I thought, oh, maybe this is another thing that I'm quite good at. So, so here we are, go. European gold medal winner, a uh, 5K athlete, yep. accomplished writer, so what what's left? What 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 are you going to aim for in two thousand and nineteen? What I'm going to aim for in two thousand and nineteen is still be a hockey player. Yeah. Um. Still be with Minda Mencat. Right. And um, one thing which also is quite important to me since I've been doing my blogs is I do want to be a spokesperson for mental health because I still feel that there is a lot of work to do and I need people's help to sort of speak out about it because they're I can't do it on my own and it saddens me that it's it, we seem to be in a culture where as soon as someone says the word mental health, it's like, oh, it's fine, it's fine, okay, mental health, it's fine. It's not. It, it's not fine. I've been, I've been suffering with it for oh, pretty much most of this year and most yeah. of last year, and it's not fair. And um, that's why, at some point, I'm actually hoping to meet with the actor who's been following my blogs in in that I want to get as much help as possible to yeah. spread the word about mental health and yeah. get it out there because if I can achieve that and help one person with it, not be afraid then then i can i can be happy and that will that will mean that will mean an awful lot to me because when i'm around people um when i'm with my um hockey teammates whether i'm in my voluntary project wherever i go straight away people look at me and go Oh, he's a lovely lad, he is. He's so kind, so supportive. And and that is why I want to... That's why I want 2019. I want to get help and support out there and, and, and be the spokesperson for people because I know I can do that. I just... I just need the right help and the right push to get out there. I think I think what you said's really uh, really important. That that thing about talking about how you feel, particularly for 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 young men. Young mm. men don't don't do that easily. No, no, we don't. So I think your blogs, I think our podcasts. Uh, you know, even I mean, you you, you described your early writing as imaginary stories. Maybe, mm. maybe we should encourage you and prod you to publish some of those stories Tom because that's how you'll get that message out there but that yeah. thing about mental health and talking about it and you know expressing your feelings I mean you, you do that all the time you're mm. a very powerful self-advocate mm. in that way yeah let's talk about one or two other things yeah um, we at, at the moment we're, we're developing services um, and uh, talking to people in, in Coventry mm. uh, about how we can uh, provide uh, access to things like sports and leisure mm-hmm. recreational activities um, I mean if, 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 if you were living in Coventry 
what, what, would, what would you be saying to the to the younger mm. adults particularly uh, about you know taking part in things like sport in cycling um, running swimming I know these are all things you do yeah um, cycling I gave a go at one of the park rides yeah. in certain um, and I think uh, I think Coventry is a good place to to go because like many places you know, they need somewhere, a location needs to be found where, you know, things are not as heard of and mm. and it's quite quiet. Um, and I think, I don't know whether it's true or not, but, you know, where, when someone speaks about Coventry, no one, no one really says, oh, Coventry is a great place for swimming, Coven-, you know. And I think that sort of similar problem with Birmingham is that someone says Birmingham, and sadly all people seem to think about or associate with Birmingham, is drinking food. But (laughs) it's so much more than that. And I think think to help get Coventry on the map and, you know, we can get young people involved and get them to give things a go and yeah. they'll, they'll enjoy it and they'll go, oh, I've never thought about swimming before. I, I might enjoy enjoy that. And it, it brings, and also with the cycling, it brings families together. You know, young yeah. people can go, oh, I don't really spend much time with my mum and dad. Maybe that might bring us together and, yeah. and give them something to do together and... Okay. Um, I mean, Coventry is a um, city of sport, mm. um, and, and we, we were at the launch of the city of sport um, a couple of weekends ago, and it was fantastic to see how many young people particularly wanted to try something that they, they hadn't tried before. So, fingers crossed, the things that you're talking about, that should be quite a big year. I mean, we've, uh, we've just opened some new offices in Coventry. Mm. Um, we've got big plans for the city, but we are going to focus that around getting people active, yeah. concentrating on people's uh, uh, emotional well-being, their physical well-being, mm. get people active, and, and, and the city of sport thing will be a, an important part of that. Let's talk about some of the big issues of the day while, before we finish. Um, no one can avoid a conversation uh, nope. about Brexit. <laughs> nope, sadly uh, not. <laughs> what, what, what are your thoughts on Brexit, Tom, and how do you think that might affect people with a disability or... You know, particularly young people generally. I mean, what what are your thoughts on Brexit? Um, okay, so what my thoughts are, and I still remember I was going through um, at the time where Midland Men Cap had that strike in in front of the um, oh the Save building. Our Support campaign. Yeah, our support about, campaign. Yeah. Um, I was going through. Um, Pippin Tribunal at the time yeah. and yet I went on that day because it was something that mattered to me yeah. um, and I think um, what I think people don't realise is without people like Midland Mencap yeah. um, and other services yeah. and you know if there's what are people going to do when men and men cap aren't around? The thing about the Save Our Support campaign, you see, was that we were able to convince the politicians in mm. Birmingham to reverse the cuts and actually invest in people with uh, vulnerable adults, vulnerable children in the city. And, and, and I think the message, the campaign, the, uh, the, the protests that, that you're talking about that you went on, they were they really influenced the politicians mm. and uh, you, you know changed the way that they wanted to make sure that people were supported in the city. What about the the, the, the politicians in London? Do you think oh. that they care about people no. like yourself and that you know the the thing about Brexit that that'll make it better or worse no, for you as a person? They don't, they don't care. That they, they don't. And what what really worries me um, about Brexit happening is. I'm a 27-year-old living in a one-bed flat and paying rent. 
And what worries me is that other kids like me, what happens to them if they can't afford, if they can't afford to live on their own? They'll be, they'll be on the streets, they'll be homeless. And that, that you know, there's, unfortunately, not a lot of kids now are living with families, they're on their own, you know, they're trying to find a place to live, they're trying to f- get to college or, you know, they're, they're basically just trying to live and unfortunately, what I see happening is that if people, including the government, don't start caring about people with learning disabilities, is that they are going to have a massive struggle on their hands because there's going to be loads of kids like like myself who won't have any support and will end up will end up in a mess because they don't seem to understand of how financially hard it is to keep a roof over your head. So it seems to me that you think Brexit's going to make things a lot worse I, for, I do. for everybody. I, I really so, do. So what, what message would you send to Theresa May and the politicians who really need to sort out uh, um, the Brexit mess? What would, what would be your message, Tom? My message would be just have a think about disabled people's lives and how, yet again, like I said before, the, there's a big difference between... Yes, okay, everyone's normal, but there is a big difference between having a disability and not have a real think about people's with learning disabilities needs because you know it's about it's about keeping a roof over their head, making sure they're fed, having somewhere to go. You know, just getting a life, and I think I'm sorry to say it, but I think they're they're too focused on themselves, and they don't they don't take five minutes to think about kids and and the struggles that they have, and they think that that their life's easy. It's not. It's no. not easy. I've had the amount of struggles that we get on a day to day basis just to live is so unfair so if the MPs do listen listen to how hard it is for us please just take time to have a think and think about how you can support us please it's not much to ask, is it? No, not much. Not much. Not much, much. to ask at all. That, that, that's brilliant, Tom. Um, I think we'll end this podcast here. Yep. I mean, we'll be back. We'll yes, be back we in will. a month's time with, with our next podcast. Yep. I think that's been uh, brilliant, mate. Yep. really enjoyed doing that. And I look forward Me to too. doing the next one. Yep. Thanks very much for sharing those thoughts with us. Mm-hmm. I say, we'll be back in a month's time. Yes, we will. And, uh, and your I've blog's going to be out way. in a few weeks' time. The next blog will be out. Yes, it will. So good luck with that. Make sure you follow Tom on Twitter and get a copy of his blog. Yes, And we'll see you do. all in a few weeks. Yep. Thank you.